is Jamie Wilson. And I'd like to take a minute to thank you all for taking time out of your day to attend my talk. Today I'll be speaking to you about the potential role of ABC transporters in prosopontal resistant schistosomes. Schistosomes being the causative agent of schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis is a parasitic disease caused by a blood-dwelling flukeworm of the genus Schistosoma. There are three species of schistosomes that cause schistosomiasis in humans. They are Schistosoma hematobium, Schistosoma japonicum, and Schistosoma mansoni, which we studied here on UNM campus in the Cunningham lab. This is actually a picture of an adult male and female schistosome when they pair together. According to the CDC, more than 200,000 deaths per year are caused by schistosomiasis in Sub-Saharan Africa alone. Some of the symptoms of chronic schistosomiasis include enlarged liver, blood in the urine and feces, increased risk of bladder cancer, and in rare instances, eggs from the schistosome can actually be found in the brain and in the spinal column, which can cause paralysis, seizures, and inflammation of the spinal cord. Also, according to the CDC, schistosomiasis is second only to malaria as the most devastating parasitic disease. 249 million people are affected by this disease worldwide. Of those, 114 million are school-aged children. This disease is found in tropical and subtropical areas of the world, such as Africa, Asia, and South America. These places experience high rates of poverty and less than adequate sanitation. The life cycle of the schistosome is a complicated one. This disease is actually contracted through contact with infected freshwater sources. And as you can see here, when the eggs come in contact with water, they hatch a uh, mercidia, which infects the intermediate host, which is the freshwater snail. There they mature into a cercaria, which is shed into the surrounding freshwater source and infects the permanent human host, <coughs> percutaneously or through the skin. Those cercaria then travel through the body, through the lungs, to the liver and the intestines, where they mature further into adult sexually mature worms, and they mate and produce eggs. Those eggs can then migrate through the body again and can become lodged in the tissues, causing granulomas, which are the body's response to foreign objects in the tissues and actually causes inflammation. Or they can be passed via the urine and feces again into the fresh water source and continue the cycle. The most widely used treatment for this disease is prosequantal. Prosequantal has been chosen because it is an effective, inexpensive drug that has very few side effects. And as the number and reach of programs to treat this disease has increased, so has the number of people who have been treated with prosequantal. In 2006, more than 10 million people were treated with prosequantal, and by 2012, that number had risen to over 40 million. Prosequantal is not without its downfalls. It is known to be have automatic resistance in juvenile worms of this species. And as with any drug over a prolonged period of time when you use it, and this has been used for the past 30 years to treat this disease, you can actually see resistance form. And resistance has been seen in Egypt. Like I said, sexually immature worms and juveniles are known to be resistant to this drug. But the sexually mature worms are not. They actually can be treated and killed. So all of this has led to lab-resistant strains of this parasite. And we actually have a fifth-generation prosopontal resistant strain here on the UNM campus in the Cunningham lab that we're working with. This is a previous study done in the Cunningham lab where qPCR analysis was used to look at multidrug resistant gene expression, which is what I will be looking at. But we looked at it in juveniles and adults, and we wanted to see why resistance is seen in juveniles. 
And as you can see on the bottom axis, we have 28 days versus 42 days. So they were treated at two different time points with varying concentrations of the sclerosis plantal. And in the red, we, have, we see that the 28-day worms were actually expressing this gene that is causing them to be resistant. And these genes that were expressed were these SMBCRP2, SMDR3, SMMRP2, SMDR1, and SMMRP1 genes. But they were not expressed in the adult worms. What I would like to know is, what is the role of these ATP binding cassette transporters in prosopontal resistant schistosomes? So ATP binding cassette proteins are actually these little pumps, and they pump things in and out of the cell, and they use ATP or energy to do that. So I want to know if they're responsible for resistance. Our hypothesis is that reduced sensitivity is actually due to the induction of these genes whose expressed proteins actually excrete prosopontal from the worm cells themselves. And those genes encode ATP binding cassette proteins. This is our experimental setup in the lab. So we're breeding resistance, like I said. We have a non-selected group as well as a selected group. The non-selected group is our control group. And as you can see here, we have the different passage numbers as well as the dosage and the treatment days post-infection. Passage 1, in both the selected group and the non-selected group, were treated at 35 days and 37 days post-infection. Passage 2 through 5 were treated at 28 days and 35 days post-infection. In the control group, they're treated with vehicle only, meaning they receive no prosopontal whatsoever. And in the selected group, you can see that we're increasing the prosopontal dosage as they go along. And there was actually a sort of false start to this whole thing where we started to treat them and treated them with 100 milligrams per kilogram of prosopontal in the first try and killed all of them. So we know that it's lethal. And as you can see here, by starting with a lower dose and increasing the dosage, we've surpassed that 100 milligrams per kilogram for prosopontal and have actually gotten to 250 milligrams per kilogram by passage 5. So we are seeing resistance being formed. These are the results of the selection of the prosopontal resistance that we've seen. Again, in this graph, we see passage 1 through 5, the treatment that they were given, either vehicle or prosopontal, and the mean number of parasites that were taken from each of these groups. This is just a visual depiction of this information, and in the red, we have the selected group, and in the blue, we have the non-selected group. And as you can see, as time goes on, this gap is actually widening, and we're seeing more of the selected group surviving than the non-selected group. So for my research, I have three steps that I perform. The first is total RNA extraction, which is the most important process of the whole thing. Because without good RNA concentration, I can't produce single-stranded cDNA, and I will receive no results from my qPCR. These are some of the RNA extractions I performed in the lab recently. On the x-axis, we have the sample numbers 1 through 11, and on the y-axis, in the red, we have the um, amount of RNA extracted in uh, nanograms per microliters. And in the orange, we have the number of parasites that these were extracted from. So samples 1 through 6 were extracted from single male worms, and samples 7 through 11 were extracted from 20 worms, both male and female. And as you can see, RNA concentration can vary when you're extracting them. So we chose quantitative PCR to look at these because it allows us to analyze multiple genes at one time. So we can analyze all nine of these genes in one, one group. So we plan to analyze all nine of these different ABC proteins in the cells of the drug-sensitive worms and compare those with the drug-insensitive worms to see whether we have the expression of those genes or not. And these are actually chosen because of the resistance that we saw in the juvenile worms. This is an ongoing project. 
And we would like to know if this is a manifestation of increased ATP binding cassette protein activity. And if it is, this can tell us how this can become problematic in the field, and also how we can possibly prolong the life of prosopagol. I'd like to take a minute to thank my mentor, Dr. Charles Cunningham, as well as the grad student in our lab, Melissa Sanchez, and the Ronald E. McNair program for this opportunity. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. For, for my point of observation, it's a very, very thorough study. And I just want to applaud your efforts based on the slides that you've shown us and the amount of um, data analysis that actually went with it. And you were able to go through the slides. And the simplicity of your presentation also put me in the edge of my seat to look at these things. I enjoy it when I'm listening to a theory that's not familiar to me, and I can be part of that, and I can step out of this space and talk about it. And I think that's the essence of our presentation. Uh, besides that, I just wanted to mention the issue of proximity, uh, the way the United States you give us cases from Africa and other places. Uh, you didn't give us sufficient detail about what's happening at our backdoors. So, uh, in our book, Hockey we have incidents so that we can be aware. Ebola is here now. We have one person who has that. Right. And then HIV, all the same. So uh, would you tell us if we have these incidents in um, Louisiana, uh, Queens, New York City, uh, if you have an idea of that. And uh, to tie that up, um, I would also appreciate if uh, you can define what you mean by poverty. So I can tie that to Whatever we have it in the United States, okay, so the, the operational definition of poverty is we mentioned in other countries. Okay, so we do not experience this disease in the United States. The thing about this disease is, like I said, it involves an intermediate host, and without that intermediate host, which is the freshwater snail, it can't be spread. In places that this is found, like I said, in Africa, Asia, and South America, they do possess these intermediate hosts. And because they live in places where they work in the water, washing cars, they play in the water, they bathe in the water, you know, this is their main source of water. So they're contracting this disease because the snail is present and because they live in places that they don't possess bathrooms, they don't possess showers, they don't possess any of these things that would prevent us from contracting this kind of disease. So that's what I mean by poverty and why we wouldn't see it here in the United States. Yes, go ahead. So um, I want to thank you for presenting this research. And uh, I want to know, because it is really imperative, what, what are you planning to do with this? Do you plan on uh, going on and publishing it or using it as like PhD thesis, things like that? Um, we absolutely plan to publish it, and we're hoping, because the mode of action for prosopagol is actually unknown. They don't know how the drug works, so the next generation of the drug can't be produced. So we're hoping to just see how the resistance is being built into these worms, so that hopefully we can prolong the life of the drug. Any other questions? Okay, great.